Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Outcast. I am your host, Wolf, and I am joined by... HC. No rush this time, sadly. Unfortunately. Especially since it's a little bit of a tradition here, but we're doing this one without rush since he was unable to be here. We're covering Ruby Volume 7, finally. It's out. Yeah, HC has I... watched it uncharacteristically fast for once. And yeah, we're you here know, to talk I was about, about to say, you say, you say finally, but then again, when you really get into it, the, this season ended like a month ago, and mm. I and the fact that I watched it in that time is kind of unusual to me. But hey, I I did it. We're here. That's what matters. <laughs> Fair enough. So, volume seven. What do you, what did you think? You are the, you are you know. Uh, kind of an introduction to those who are just f- tuning in. First of all, mm-hmm. welcome. Always good to have you here. Mm-hmm. But uh, the second thing is that we've covered all the previous six volumes of Ruby before. and At my behest. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Wolf is the <laughs> biggest w- Ruby guy out of, every- out of everyone here because... Mm-hmm. Because you know this, uh, he he's the one who suggested the, that we do this, and Rush and I kind of just tagged along. So you know, R- Wolf is the bigger Ruby nerd. I am just in for the ride, and I'm enjoying the ride for the most part. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's the bigger fan. So with that said, what did you think about this season? Yep. To let you all know, like how we normally try to cover this, we'll do. Non-spoiler general overall thoughts first, and then we'll jump into more of our spoilerish thoughts after that, and we'll let you know when that is. So if you've never watched Ruby, or if you've not watched Volume 7 yet, this is your chance to not be spoiled about our thoughts. So with that said, overall, I enjoyed Volume 7, I would say. I think I'm going, you know, I, I've talked about this a little bit elsewhere as well, but I think the finale is probably my least favorite, and when I say finale, I mean the f- final two episodes i feel like the finale suffers from a very familiar problem that ruby suffers from and that is that it that ruby tends to at times move too fast for its own good i feel and i feel the finale suffers from that issue for volume seven but overall i think everything leading up to that and even though i might have issues with the finale i still think it's overall enjoyable and good and fun and worth a watch so you like this season? Overall, yeah. I am very mixed. Hmm, that's interesting. I am very mixed because on the one hand, on the one hand, uh, there, there's something that I don't really like in these kind of shows, and that's when a show, you know, kind of starts to get too, for lack of a better term, political with its world. Ah. Uh. And... Ah, <laughs> and I, but based on that, ah, I assume you kind of you would agree with me that this is the most political season in the show. I guess I I, I don't think this is well. It's it's not entirely a spoiler, but yeah, I do get exactly where you're coming from. I don't one hundred percent agree with you, but I understand like, we'll where get, people we'll come get from. A, you know, we'll get more into this as we go along, obviously. Mm-hmm. But but the thing is that um, Ruby was always, you know, to me it was it's kind of like a science fiction fantasy show. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, there are some places where I do like it. Uh, don't get me wrong. And honestly, this show is not the worst when it comes to it. But at the same time. We've gone from a show about, you know, basically high school students learning how to fight and defend themselves mm-hmm. into into a show with these same high schoolers still now being a part of like a, of like a political war. And it's like, what does this have to do with everything that's been up thus far? Yeah, I know that characters that we that we got to know in the previous volumes are involved, but at the same time, why am I watching politics? And the thing is that this, you know, you could say, oh, it's not that bad as long as, you know, it moves the plot or anything. And here's the thing. I don't think we really accomplished anything in this season when it's all said and done. Again, we'll get more into this in 
spoilers section, but you know, when I look about when I look over what each season since the fall of Beacon has given us, this is the one where I honestly feel like we accomplished the least when it was all said and done. That's an interesting take, if I'm honest. It's not one I've heard from anyone else within the fandom being a part of the fandom, so it's interesting to hear that from more of an outside viewer, you know, and how you view the show. I think that's actually really interesting. Because, you know, let me ask you, hmm, I guess I'll save that question for when we get more into spoilers, because I think that question would probably entail going more into spoilers. So instead, I should ask, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first new volume with Crow's new VA. What did you think? Yeah, a little bit into that. <laughs> I beat yeah, you to I it. I was about to bring this up. Uh, I'm a good host. But, uh, yeah, well, you are sometimes. Mm. But the thing, but the thing is, um, but the thing about it, you know, to those who don't know, Crow has been voiced up to this point by Vic. I don't know what the guy that voices Brawly in Dragon Ball. That's and, what I know him. <laughs> um, Ed from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. A lot, a lot of the uh, roles, basically. Yeah, a and, lot. Uh, fo- yeah, and <laughs> following some uh, allegations made against him, uh, he was fired from all of the Rooster Teeth uh, shows that he's been a part of. Mm-hmm. Uh, this been on no exception. And honestly, I think his replacement is as good as we could get. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's. I think they picked the best person possible for the job, and I think. If you put the two voices beside, obviously you would notice a difference, sure. But I think, oh, who is it? Who is his name? I'm gonna feel bad for getting for forgetting it. But I I do think that he's done a good job filling that gap and you know having the name be something that just you know, or having the voice be something that you know it doesn't. Uh, stick out in any majorly bad way or anything like that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if you, I think if you weren't aware of the entire thing being even happening, you would probably not, fi- <clears throat> you know, you could probably not figure this out right ahead, but mm-hmm. you know, it's one of those changes that, you know, it doesn't really matter in the long run. It's similar enough. It doesn't really take away from anything. It's not distracting. That's Jason the, Jason Librecht is his name. Is the new VA for Crow, and that's his name. And I think he's done a great job, feel you know, replacing Vic and making the character still feel like the character. And I'll say this: despite the difference, though, after like uh, like by the second episode, it was like nothing really changed. Like uh, yeah. I think if he needed to adjust, he adjusted really quickly. Yep, I'll say I this. agree. I think he fit into the role. You know. Almost like again, like you said, episode one, like okay, all right, yeah, you know, I knew he was going to be different. I had heard he was, you know, I you knew I knew the VA was going to change and everything because I am in I'm in involved with the fandom, so I knew all this and what was kind of going on there. So, you know, hearing about the change, like all right, you know, give him a chance, see what he can do, and I think he came in and did exceptionally well. It, it, you know, even within the first episode, I think he fits in perfectly. But after the first episode, it feels like oh, this has just always been Crow's voice. And I think that's a great way to go about it. I think that's I don't think they could have asked for a better VA to fill in that role, to be honest. Yeah. Well, on that note, um there is one thing that I'll say. It's not a major spoiler, but for the say for the sake of safety, if you don't want to hear anything about the show, you you know you can uh, close it. Uh, you can close it down now. Again, yep. no, no big plot details are about to be given yet, but I'm putting a warning now because this is something that some people might consider as spoiler. Okay. So I think this season tried to be a lot more fan servicey in in terms of stuff that happened. In, in terms. Of, Anything in specific you want to point out? Uh, I have two. Uh, you know, let's say two and a half because uh, one, because two of those things are actually kind of connected to the same idea. Mm-hmm. One is one is ships, and the other one is characters. 
So when you, sh- you uh, so just to be clear, when you say shipping, you mean like you know romant- When you say ships, you mean romantic ships and relationships. Yeah, romantic right. ships. Okay, okay. Yeah. I think I know what you're talking about now. And the other is characters, so I think I also know what you're talking about with that one as well. But go ahead. And after okay. this, ladies and gentlemen, we'll jump into our kind of more episode by episode analysis and definitely. Yeah, spoilers. and uh, and for the sake of the argument, I also won't say what ship or characters I mean yet, because we'll get to this when we actually go into spoilers. But <laughs> at the but at the same time, be forewarned. Mm-hmm. So. And so basically, uh, so there are two ships that, you know, one is very popular and one is very popular and the other, I personally kind of cut eye on it, uh, of it. And you told me that it's something that's been running around in the fandom, but, uh, then I, but it's nothing big like the other one. And the, the thing I have with this is that I don't have a problem with the ships th- themselves far from it. And it's also, you know, if you remember some of the stuff I said in the previous uh, volume reviews, one of those shapes include my favorite character in the show. Mm-hmm. With that said, though, I think the way they approached it makes make it seem too much of fan service because the because it seems like the writers never had any intention to have those ships be a thing like when the show's creator his name is monty right yes monty owen was the show was yeah, the original uh, creator was the original front runner behind the show before he passed yeah uh, so god bless his soul mm-hmm. but uh the, but the thing is i i don't want to speak on his behalf or anything Mm-hmm. But it feels like he never intended any of the characters to be shipped, or at least he didn't plan on doing anything with it. Like it didn't. It it feels like he didn't really plan on any of the characters to fall in love with each other. And all of a sudden, now when the ships became such a big thing in the fandom, from what you told me, the uh, and it seems like all of a sudden the writers are trying to steer in that direction and the thing is that and they try and do this you know the slow way like we need to build this these relationships up because there was no base for it and the and the fact of the matter is that either if the base that we had so far is platonic and not romantic these characters knew each other for such a long time by this point I don't need this bullshit. Oh, I noticed something about her that makes me giggle. Oh, oh they are always together. Oh. Maybe one <laughs> thinks about this. Maybe one thinks that. We don't need that. If you're going to do fan service, Fee. just do it at this point. You're treading dangerous ground with the Ruby fandom. So, <laughs> treading dangerous ground with the Ruby fandom. For the, I will repeat again. I have no problem with the ships themselves. Far from it. What I have a pro- but I can have a problem with how it was handled. Ruby Phantom takes their ships dangerously seriously at times, unfortunately. Um, I, I will counter that slightly, right, and say that <laughs> Miles Luna and Carrie Shawcross, two of the, you know, they're the two head writers and I guess executive producers are main people behind Ruby now. And they were, yes. they were working on Ruby with Monty when it was first created. So yeah. I'll counter that a little bit by saying that it might need that. It may not be as, you know, out of nowhere, right. It may not have, you know, be a thing that they just now started to hit on. It might've been something that they had planned from the beginning, at least with those two anyways, right? Because they've been in it from the beginning with Monty. So it, it is yeah, worth but at the same that time, out, I feel. But at the same time, you could make the argument that now that Monty is no, is no more and, you know, there's <laughs> nothing to really stop them. I get you know. that. I, I do get where you're coming from. I, I think it's... It, it, I, I don't think... It's fan servicey, and I don't think they're just doing it out of nowhere. I think the problem more no, 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 pertains. No, 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 no. You didn't get me. I'm not saying they're doing it out of nowhere. Okay. What I what I mean what I mean is is that they're trying to go through all the phases 
of uh, having a ship in the show rather than have them having the ship to begin with. Because uh-huh. like I said, I think we had this buildup. I could believe that these two characters, in both cases I'm, I'm meaning to, fell in love before. Mm-hmm. I don't need all of this awkward phasing to happen. So you think they should have just kept doing what they were doing with the relationship and it just built into what it would have eventually built just, into? All, like, or just have them be just, in the relationship they yeah, want or just, Yeah, like ju- just start the relationship in this season. Don't, uh, don't give me the entire stuttering or doing this or doing that. Just have it. We had the bill, you know, we had seven years with these characters. We could believe it by this point. I think there's I, a reason. Pe- there's a reason people ship them. This is true. I think that's a completely fair assessment. I, I would agree with that. I think, yeah, I can ex- see exactly where you're coming from now, and I would completely agree with that. I think you're exactly right in that we don't need to have them do the awkward stuff. It's not necessary. I get that. I completely get that. Mm-hmm. Well, if that's all well, for general spoilers and all, general thoughts. Yes. We can get so, into more spoiler-specific episode... stuff, and we can actually talk about what ship HC means. If you haven't figured it all yet, out yet, buzz buzz. If you have a, if you haven't figured it out, buzz buzz. We're not a Ruby fan, <laughs> but uh, yeah, spoilers from this from three to one. <laughs> you're still, still here, good. Mm-hmm. You're still here, good. The ships I was referring to are Bumblebee and whatever Ruby and. Oscar is called, I don't know. Hey, a lot of people have... Pro- I'll disagree with the... with It's Rose Garden is what Oscar and Ruby are called, and a lot of people have issues with that because of Ozpin, but different story, really, with that. But I'll disagree with that one. Yeah, that was an awkward moment, but I feel like that fits those characters a lot more. When when you talk oh, no, about... No, no, no. It fits, it fits the characters, yes. But, again... There was no awkwardness up until this point. I, I do think, right, that with these two, it makes more sense because we've not had as much time with Oscar and Ruby together. With Blake and Yang, I can at least see where you're coming from, right? When Yang gets mm-hmm. all, hey, I'm going to flirt a little bit. Oh, wait, I'm terrible at flirting, apparently. Like, a lot of people said they liked that for her character. And this is something that happens within the first episode, within the third episode, right? We have. Yes. You know, Blake cuts her hair in the third episode. It's shorter. Yang notices and pays attention, and she's staring, obviously. And, you know, she's, you know, giggling while holding her hand behind her head, going, Oh, no, I like it. You look really great. And, you know, being really terrible at being a flirt, apparently. Yeah. Which is so, fine for her uh, character, but you, you know, it, it does. Fi- again, it's fine for the character, but, uh, but at the same time, you could, like, you could have told me that these two like were together after the ending of the previous volume where they both fought Adam. Like you could have told me at this point, this is it. This like this is their starting off point <coughs> in terms of uh, being a romantic couple. And I would have bought that. I would have bought that completely. Mm-hmm. But uh, but no, we need to go through that. I don't know how to flirt, or let's be awkward, or have no run, run, be be like, what do you think they're doing together? What do you think? It's like we we saw that. We know this is going to happen. Why do all of this teasing? Just give us the damn fan service if you are going if you're going to do this. <laughs> yeah, I can again, like with Blake and Yang, I get that. We've had a long enough time with these two characters and their relationship to be built up that I can get not wanting to do any of the awkward nonsense that most relationships try and do on, you know, the screen, on the big screen, and just get straight to it. I can get that with them. With Ruby and Oscar, I could say at least, you know, hey, I think this being built up in this way is okay because we've not had as much time with these two characters together on screen. Like, Oscar's only been in two, three volumes at most. So, well, f- technically yeah, this, four, but this, mostly this three. Applies. This applies to Yang and Blake more than Ruby and Oscar, but the yeah. Uh, so... But I do get where you're coming from, though. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But on to episode one, the Greatest Kingdom. The so Greatest Kingdom. We start off with getting so... our first view of Mantle. And what did you think? It reminds me of Hicksville from Gravity Rush. 
That's fair. I think that's a good comparison because, you know, considering the two cities, you know, especially with Atlas floating in the air and Mantle yeah. below. Yeah. So, um, I don't know, maybe it's me, but, um, is it, you know, I think we were just kind of thrown into this season with no yeah. real, like, uh, it's, a, oh, okay, we are in this new city. Like, oh, oh okay, Ironwood is, you know, running things. Oh, uh, okay, uh, Winter is working with them. Uh, oh, okay, this, it's a, wait, let's slow down. Kind of remind me where we are. Where we are. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's worth pointing out, right, that the creators behind the show talked a little bit about when Volume 6 ended, how there was an episode, an entire episode, if I'm not mistaken, that was cut from Volume 6. Now, that's not to say that episode one of volume seven was this episode, but there's, you know, a lot of thought of how, you know, looking at how the first episode for volume seven kind of just gets straight into things and you're just in the thick of it right then and there. I think it's safe to say that this is probably parts of volume seven's first episode was what was supposed to be the ending for volume six. So I think that's why it has more of that you're just in there and this is what's going on and here's Mantle and here's everything that's going wrong with you know Mantle what? In and how this bad case, it looks. In this case, I would argue that episode three could have been a better opener. You're not the only yeah. one to say that. And I think a lot of people do feel that, you know, episode three is more or less where volume seven really begins. That the first two episodes of volume seven is kind of more volume six six ish and episode three is where you're like this is volume seven which is a weird position to be in i think for the show with that said though you know uh thoughts about all the political <laughs> stuff aside there is something I, I do like the entire that we all start in this season with a bit of a different tone which mm -hmm. is something that's also you know kind, kind of becomes a thing for the rest of this season. And honestly, I do like this new tone, especially for Ruby's character. It feels like Ruby has developed throughout this season, mm -hmm. and I like this change. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Very much agreed. <clears throat> with the, so with that said, you know, there there is kind of a there is kind of an idea behind this world and you know what we are about what we need to expect from, from this season. You know, so it's, I'll say it's a good setup, but again, a bit more of a, I don't know, maybe they could do something like the Netflix recaps just to remind me. But, uh, and it's not, and it's not necessarily the show's fault. I've just, you know, saw other things. I've been busy with other stuff in my life that, uh, you know, I didn't have time to catch up on mm. volume six again. That's completely fair. But, again, like I'm a fan who watches everything a little bit more regularly and kind of keeps up with the fandom. So I'm more reminded of all those old events more so than a casual watcher. So I think that's an interesting, you know, viewpoint where, you know, as a casual watcher and someone who doesn't go back to rewatch the show, or anything of that nature, just coming in like, hey, this is my next rewatch, you know, this is my new watch of the new volume, as it's completely finished. It, it's an interesting take, and it's kind of, you know, I think that's worth hearing because, you know, you as a regular viewer were a bit, whoa, over, you know, overwhelmed by that first episode, or first potentially two episodes, really, and just everything that's being thrown at you all at once. I think that's an interesting take because it kind of does show, like, you know, maybe the show did move too fast maybe the show does need something that's there you know for the more casual viewer or maybe the show doesn't need to care about that and they just need to cater to their direct fan base and you're either a fan of ruby by this point or you're not it's an interesting dichotomy there that you have to kind of try and balance and figure out if you even want to yes but so... we should say first episode, <clears throat> we see a bit of, you know, the group being worried about, you know, how Ironwood and the city looks and how it feels very oppressive, you know, going into that a bit of political theme where it feels like at that point in time that Ironwood is, you know, militaristically commandeering the city for himself and taking it over and things of that nature with all the different, you know soldiers walking around and kind of keeping a handle on the people in mantle and then we see a bit more of kind of the 
I, I guess you'd say negative vibe that all that has when we have our Grim attack, the Sabres, a new Grim, yeah. which is really cool to see. I like how all the Grim from this season are very much kind of that old, I don't want to say, you know, Ice Age type deal with mam woolly mammoths and, you know, old yeah, saber that's cats. A, that's another thing I do want to point out that, you know, it feels like we, you know, the bigger Grim that would have once been considered a threat to the characters are suddenly the ones that are taking down the most, which uh, which shows growth. And that's a good point. And you know, and you know, just to see you know how much they are improving, what was once a threat becomes another regular thing we need to take down. Mm -hmm. But and, I mean, they do you know, still have those, you know, grim that are threats, as we'll get into much oh, later in this course, volume. <laughs> of course, of course, I'm not I'm not saying that those which is are nice. done. I, but, but I, uh, on the contrary, I, I'm saying that you know doing doing this though means that we can have we can open the room for more new grim that are more mm -hmm. threatening. Mm -hmm. I agree, and I think it fits with the show the, the show's kind of theme that I feel it's been doing with the grim that the grim individually by themselves aren't that much of a threat, but when you get the grim in a large group and you have to and the hunters you know huntsmen and huntresses also have to protect innocent people along with that that's when the Grimm become more of a threat. And I think it also, I think this season more than any other really shows the biggest threat that the Grimm faces to huma humanity, which is, you know, the Grimm's relentless pursuit of them, the relentless dogged, you know, the, that dogged, that dogged untiredness of, and pursuit of humanity wherever they may be at. The second they get a whiff of negative emotion, we all go there and attack. And they constantly have to deal with that, and it's constantly in the background and constantly has something that they have to deal with and worry about. Sure, they fend yeah. it off. It's not a big deal. It, it's, it's fairly easily dealt with, but it's still there. It's something they just have to deal with constantly. I think that really speaks to that idea of the Grimm and what the Grimm are supposed to be the best. I think the, this volume has done the best with speaking to that idea of what the Grimm's true strength is. Mm -hmm. which is that just that dogged pursuit of humanity wherever they may find them which is nice which you know, i i think anyways <laughs> but well after our uh, fight after a pretty you know good fight and it's royal yeah. animated and getting to see everyone kind of do something or you know their thing within this fight even oscar uh, yeah gets a and small again scene. and again yeah and again it was uh, also in terms of growth i like the fact that it looks like you know, these people have been fighting alongside each other for a long time now. Mm -hmm. And this does look <laughs> like, you know, they're starting to get comfortable with each other and know and they start to know how well how well they walk off each other that, you know, they could plan combos and know that, you know, who who does what, who takes on dance, who do this and and you know, it's fun to see. Mm -hmm. But the two bigger reveals in this episode, our first new character, Dr. Pietro Polandina, Penny's father. And yeah, he, and that leads us to Penny coming back. Mm -hmm. Penny is back to life. Can't put a good robot, robot girl down. You know, I've heard stuff about it, and I, I have no problem with her coming back, because, you know, mm -hmm. she's a robot. It's You're part. breaking up a so little well, bit on not... my part. Oh, sorry, I'm. Is it okay now? Maybe it's been it's been in and out is the issue, so I don't know. Oh. We will see. Um, basically, what I want to say is that uh, you know, the 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 thing about the thing about Penny coming back is that she's a robot, so it's not necessarily out of left field that she's back. With that said, though. I don't necessarily see the point outside of again fencil. Um, a lot of people say that about Neo, as well. Last volume, so it's fair. I think. Um, yeah, I, I don't mind it. I think you know. Again, as you say, it it's it makes sense for Penny, and they do give an explanation as to why they were able to bring her back later, if I'm not mistaken. Like we hear. Oh well, this is why, or you know, and it's easily tellable. And I think it it makes her a nice moment with Ruby and Penny here at the end of this episode, and you know, is a bit you know, is the big reveal for this episode and all of that. We, we, again, it, it's nice, and I don't think it's. 
I guess you could call it fan service if that's what you choose to call it. I don't personally think it is. I think it works for what it is and is, you know, apparently a, you know, a, a kind of a major plot point of her being back is a, a later thing. So I think it works. I think there's nothing wrong with it. I think, you know, this is the best way to do something like this. I don't think they could have done it in a better way. Yeah, on a, again, I have no problem coming back. At the same time, though, <clears throat> I don't I don't really see the point in the long run. Well, it, I disagree, but I, I do get where you're coming from, I suppose. Again, like, again, you know, looking at I, I suppose for the finale, you know, looking at Penny becoming the, you know, Winter Maiden. I think it does serve that purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. kind of serving no, no. the purpose of, remember, you know, Penny's supposed to be the stand-in for the, you know, for Pinocchio, right? Like, she's our, I'm a real girl, you know, deal. And her getting the maiden power, I think, kind of falls in line with that. Oh, you know, her soul is a real soul. She is real, right? She's not just a robot. Or a robot, yeah. So I think it kind of falls in line with that continuation of her story in that way, which is interesting. Okay, that's fair. And again, it's it's nice to have her back. <laughs> also, she's gone through some upgrades, and I'm a upgrade. Mm -hmm. But we end episode one off with our heroes getting arrested, and the lamp being taken from them. Mm -hmm. And that moves us straight into episode two. Episode two. Um, you know, I it's kind of sad, honestly, that I only saw this uh, season a few days ago, and I I kind of forgot how this episode even goes. But um, I will say that one thing that I do remember about it that I like is the, um, you know that Winter and Weiss do have an interesting relationship. Mm -hmm. I I loved this moment. All right. So we start off episode two, a new approach with, you know, we're going to Atlas and we're going to specifically Atlas Academy. And we have a slightly new character in the name of Forrest, who everyone in the fandom fell in love with for some reason. <laughs> Instantly, I guess. I don't know why, but I guess it's because what happens to him in the next episode. But yeah, he uh he's back. He has, a th well, not the next episode, in episode five, if I'm not mistaken, or four, when somewhere in there. Either way, you know, he kind of has a big deal, and he kind of reveals a little bit about Robin and her happy huntresses, which becomes important, much more important later on. Mm -hmm. But the big thing here is, oh, we're finally in Atlas, and, you know, our gang sees Ironwood, Winter, and Penny, and, you know, they kind of say, hey, what's up? Can we get these cuffs taken off? And Winter has a big thing of you know being winter and you know, then we get into a big talk that comes later on in this episode but you know something i enjoyed i enjoyed a lot of the smaller animations like you know you see the shock and the relief on winter's face when she sees you know weiss and then she immediately goes back to the stoic military woman and you know says hey get these cuffs off of you know these people or you're going to hear it from me right and the guards that are with them immediately go, okay, and immediately start rushing to do what she says. And I loved Ironwood's little chuckle in the background, right? Because he does this a lot. You know, you have these little, like, you know, there's a, another moment where, you know, Winter's lambasting them for stealing a, you know, Atlesian airship, you know, and she's, you could have been killed. And, <clears throat> or no, it, it's, you know, how did you get here? And Ruby's like, you know, and they say something like, well, we kind of stole an airship, and Ruby's just like, well, no, uh, okay, yeah, we stole an airship, and Ironwood just laughs when he hears that. Like, he just chuckles inwardly. It's like, I, I like that. That's enjoyable. Like, small animation stuff like that is great, and it makes the characters feel more approachable and more there, I guess you would say. It adds to them. In my very yeah, rambly uh, speech there. <laughs> uh, it's okay. <clears throat> you again you, no, you it's been a little bit for you, me since i've seen episode two yeah. that was last year Ooh. um okay yeah it was last year but it wasn't a year ago <laughs> okay mm. but um anyway 
Well, one thing I will say is that I still like Noah. Noah is funny. Mm -hmm. I agree. She was a great little addition in this episode. Like, hey, can we get these cuffs off now, please? I love how, you know, she can butt in and just be really great at doing it in really, you know, enjoyable and fun ways. Um, The big thing for this episode is apparently Ironwood has told Winter and Penny about Salem and what's all going on with that. And he's also told, you know, the Aesops, the people we met earlier and we'll learn a bit more about in, I think it's later this episode, if I'm not mistaken. But <clears throat> we we hear about that and, you know, we hear that Ruby decides to not tell Ironwood and Co. what they learned from Jin or mm -hmm. what's going on with Oz and Oscar. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of that, I kind of love the... You know, I love that everyone kind of side-glanced at Ruby like, okay, we're we're lying, all right then, because no one knew what she was going to do, and they're all just kind of you know floored a little bit by it. And I also enjoyed the fact that you know you have Ironwood come up to and realizes that Oscar is Osborne and just come up to like, hey, it's so great to see you. I'm so glad you're here. And all of a sudden just have his hopes dashed that Oz isn't there. Like, that's kind of harsh. Like, you kind of see just how much he depended on him. In his own way, you know. But I've been talking a lot. What do you have to say about this episode? Um, I basically <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> like, um, you, I don't really have much to say, honestly. You mm -hmm. basically nailed it. But uh, yeah, this. But again, this does kind of, um, you know, it kind of plays into something, into a theme in this season where, you know, people are kind of keeping their cards close to the chest. Mm -hmm. And and in that regard, I'm kind of, I'm kind of eh, about the whole idea because it, it does, it does, eh, you know, it does lay there that, eh, what did I want to say? God damn it, people, shut up. So... <laughs> So yeah, but uh, what I do want to say is that everyone is gonna keeping their cards close to the chest, and you know, with with uh, you know Salem being a much bigger threat now than she was before, mm -hmm. I think this is honestly not the right time for having strategic, for having strategic, you know, information keeping policy. You know, it's like both of you have a common enemy. Why not just be open about this kind of stuff? Which again, which again, I get they they do have kind of a reason into mm -hmm. why this guy keeps a secret, why this guy keeps a secret. But at the same time, you know something that could potentially help you. Why not share it? This is your best option so far. Mm -hmm. I can see where you're coming from. I think again, I think the and show does. And also, you know, one thing, one thing that you know, I'm not sure if I'm talking about this episode only, or or if I'm jumping ahead a bit. But Iron Ironwood said that you know he doesn't want to let the people of the city know what they're planning because it will put them in a state that Salem could thrive on, that Salem could uh, manipulate, but with a grim. Mm -hmm. But at the, but at the same time, you know Ruby kind of has an information on her that I that Ironwood can use. You know they have her past, they have their, they have her history. And you could manipulate it. You could use it to your advantage in some way. Then just tell him. Believe me, you're not the only one. Many talks in the fandom have gone on about you know was what you know, about Ruby's choice and how it was a bad choice. It wasn't the logical choice, and it wasn't a good choice. And how Ruby's you know no better than Osman, and many other things like that. And a lot of people are upset in how they feel that you know the show has treated husband like this completely evil person for telling lies when these characters have done pretty much when especially ruby and especially ruby has done something very similar <clears throat> in what they did right so it, it there's been a lot of back and forth you're not the first person to be on that train of thought and, and it's definitely interesting it'll definitely be interesting to see you know based on the finale of this volume where they go with how they treat husband in the future and Oscar as well, for that matter. Yeah. So this is kind of a thing that I think you know we should. We you know we should we should not keep secrets from you know allies, and this is a problem that 
no, no, it's not really a problem, but this is a thing that kind of, you know, hunts the entire, the entire volume, and it's like, yep. let, let's just sit down and think about this. But, we can let some let uh, people let people know about seven spans. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not gonna hurt anyone. I, I agree with you. I think. I think that's why the show sets it up as, you know, Ironwood is completely open and honest with Ruby and co, but he's not necessarily honest with the people of Mantle and Atlas. You know, those are the people he most needs to be honest with, but he's not. And Ruby and co most need to be honest with Ironwood, but they're not until much later into this volume. And that does eventually end up hurting them, right? For very obvious reasons. So I I think Um... it's... You know, I think it's an interesting dichotomy, and the show does give examples and reasons why both sides need to be, I don't want to say dishonest, but just not tell the full story and the full truth right away. Like, they do have, you know, both sides have their reasons for lying to the the prospective people that they're lying to, or just not telling everyone, you know, just not telling the prospective people they need to tell all the information they have to tell them. Like, they do both have their reasons for doing the things they're doing. They're not necessarily good reasons per se, but they do have their reasons, and you can see where they are coming from as characters, I feel. Right. With that said, I think we can go on to... Well, uh, to finish off, you know, this is... I guess we can, you know, do it in episode three as well. Um, The Aesops, what do you think about them? We have, you know, we're kind of introduced to them at the end of episode two and episode three. We get I to think, really see them. I in think action. a better introduction. I think a better introduction to them is episode three, honestly. But you know, yeah. I don't mind them. I don't mind. I kind of, you know, I kind of am happy that there is no what its face. Uh, you know, there is kind of like, oh, oh, newbies. This is going to be fun. But at the same time, they do respect. They do respect. Uh, you know, Team Ruby and John and everyone. To allow them to join on missions and you know actually train them and being impressed with their abilities, so didn't mm-hmm. bother me much. They could have been a lot worse. <laughs> so worth pointing out, the Aesops, you know, A C E Ops are based off of Aesops A E S O P fables. You have, if I'm not mistaken, Clover is based on A Fisherman's Good Luck. Elm and Vine are based on the Elm and the Vine. Obviously, Harriet is based on. The hair from the tortoise and the hare, and marrow is based on the dog, the dog and its reflection, if I'm not mistaken. I'm also directly quoting that from the wiki, so if I'm wrong, they're also wrong. But we should ask, who is your favorite? Because everyone's got to have a favorite. Well, you're going to ask me this because you know I'm going to say Harriet because mm-hmm. she's the fast one. <laughs> but I, I also actually really like Harriet. I really like her design. I think she's one of the more interesting and fun designs from, you know, out of the Aesops. But I, I give them credit, right? Because even though, you know, all of the Aesops have a very similar color base and color scheme to pull from, they still each feel very unique in their character and even designs. Yeah, I think, right? You know, yeah. it's... I, I have to commend Rooster Teeth for being able to pull that off because you do have, you know... The similar color scheme, you know, it's not like, you know, hey, Ruby, Blake, and Yang, where you have these entirely different color schemes and design ideas to pull from. No, you know, these characters don't have that advantage, so you have to find a way to make them feel unique, while their look isn't necessarily going to be that unique between the five of them, but yet they manage to pull that off. So I have to commend them for that. I, I would agree. <clears throat> that you know it it is it is good to see that you know just because they wear the same uniform does it, the the action can still be distinguishable and fun. Mm-hmm. So looking at episode three specifically, you know Ruby and Junior receive upgrades to their weapons. We get to see a bit in their outfit, and, we, <clears throat> and they get new outfits this episode as well. And we get to see all of that kind of pulled off, and we get to see you know, all the different upgrades there and how they all work. You know, Jean has new functions for his shield. He finally has a landing strategy. Yeah. <laughs> and... Oh, better late than never. Do what? Better late than never. Hmm. Um, you know, we have all that going on. Then we get to see Crow gets a new outfit as well, and he's and him and Clover are growing a little close and friendly with one another as they, you know, have their back and forth. And, you know, we see that Clover's a semblance apparently is very much the antithesis to Crow's semblance, where Clover has good luck all the time. (sighs) 
Forgive me. Yeah. Um, we have, you know, we, we get to see the other Aesop's semblances. Uh, Harriet is, you know, she has super speed. And then we also, in this episode, get to learn that <clears throat> apparently Ruby's semblance isn't just super speed. It's, you know, more than that, according to Harriet, because she's seen other speed semblances, which is interesting. Yeah. And it we... is, you know, it is, it is nice to see that it's not just a typical speed thing. It's, you know, there is something more to it that's different than the other speedsters. In the... mm -hmm. Which is interesting. And, you know, we get to see Elm apparently can lock her feet in place with Aura, and then Vine has his stretchy arms. Yeah, the, those stretchy arms killed me because it reminded <laughs> me of those. And it reminded me of those, you know, those like rubber hands things that you know oh, would stick yep. to walls and stuff and they and were you the could best sling thing it out for like five yeah, minutes they were the, yeah they were <laughs> the best thing for like 10 minutes and then they won't work anymore but yep. god damn it was so satisfying to just toss them around and like, yep. catch things with him also thought of wacky wave you know wacky wave flailing inflatable arm flailing tube man tube man whatever however you say that god tongue tied <laughs> But yeah, also that thought of, but you know, we go into an abandoned dust mine to fight a geist, which is an and interesting you know, fight. For, and you know, I will say also that, you know, for an, for an episode that's basically a long action sequence, mm -hmm. I really like this episode. Yeah, we're getting to see everyone kind of show off their new weapons, their new designs and everything. And this is the episode as well where we got to see Blake and Yang flirt a little bit, which you didn't like. Again, I like the ship. I like the ship, okay? And again, Blake is my favorite character in the series. If I, there's someone who wants her to be happy with someone, specifically Yang, it's me. <laughs> but I'm Fair. not a fan of the handling of the ship rather than the ship. The captain is not a good captain. That's all I'm saying. I think I can see where you're coming. Again, I think you know we talked about that earlier. I can see exactly where you're coming from with that. And I think it would be nice to see them just say hey, let's move forward with this. We don't exactly need to do what we're doing now. But I'll have a question for you on that later, though, specifically, looking at some things with the past volume. But, um, yeah, like you said, this is just a you know very long action sequence, and it's a great long action sequence. And I think you know this is, as we talked about a little bit earlier, the, the real start of Volume 7. This is where we get into you know the real meat of Volume 7. And, okay, so Ruby's going to be working with Aesop's to set up Ironwood's plan, which was detailed to us in the last episode, which is we're trying to turn the Amity Coliseum into a brand new communications tower satellite. You know, a brand new communications satellite, essentially. So that's our plan. That's what we're going to do. <clears throat> and, you know, Ruby and spin, Ruby and Junior spend you know most of their time helping out the Aesops to do this. We see training montages here. We see a training montage with all the different characters and you know, all their different work they're going through to try and achieve this, and in the meanwhile, we see our villains in the background doing villainy things, because we see Tyrion come in and kill the forest guy who we saw from the previous episode. He lived for one episode. And that is why the fandom fell in be, love with him. I don't know. He shall be missed, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, uh, you know, the big thing here is we have an election going on in the background as well within Mantle, and it's apparently Robin versus Jacques Schnee, who we also see in this episode, Jacques Schnee. We see him come in and, you know, we see him immediately, you know, why stands up to him like, hey, you know, if she has her thing of standing up to him and then he gets angry and Ironwood turns on, you know, and he says, you know, I have half a mind to, and Ironwood says, half a mind to what, Jacques? And Jacques immediately like, <clears throat> Conf you know, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? He, um, not, ugh, crap, I cannot think of the word. He read it, you know, he writes himself, he sent centers, that's the word. He centers himself once more and then just hits home hard with that, you know, your mother was devastated when you left. And you can just see how hard that hits Weiss. Again, I love the small character animation stuff they do throughout this season where I think they've gotten even better at that from previous seasons of, the smaller animations with facial tics and things like that. It's nice. Like in this episode, another one, you see Clover, whenever <clears throat> he's about to do something, he'll kind of flick that four-leaf Clover charm on his chest, right? As a symbol of good luck, right? Which is nice. It's a nice little, you know, character tick. Yeah, um, and again, <coughs> this also kind of 
kind of goes back to what I said about the political and the political angle. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden we are having an election for something. And it's for like, the count for the councillor seat for Mantle is what it is. For a councillor seat. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? No, you're breaking up pretty bad. Oh, okay. So you might want to you might want to leave and try again. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's just me and you now. While he's gone, I don't really have anything to say. I just have to fill the air. So, hello. <laughs> I guess talking a bit about. I, I, I can kind of see where HC is coming from with the... Oh, he's back. Can we hear him? Hello? Testing. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I think you're good. Continue good. talking about your political rally hate. Yeah, so again, what, uh, what I mean by this is that, you know, we're literally having an election. It's <clears throat> yes. not like we need, to, we need to take out the leader or, you know, the government is evil or anything. Well, having an election, well, the government which, is evil. Also, ends up kind of becoming a, a bit of a thing too, I suppose. Really, with yeah, Ironwood. Yeah, but yeah, but at the same time, you know, you could kind of tell where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. You can tell he has a reasoning that you can follow. What yeah. I don't usually like, I say, like about political stuff and these kind of things is that there's a side that's been portrayed as right, mm -hmm. and here. You know, the only wrong thing we really get in this whole political debacle is that, uh, you know, Weiss's father basically buys his way to, the, uh, to office. That's really all there is to it. Anything else, you can kind of tell the sides. Uh, you can kind of tell both sides. Both sides are legitimate. Both sides have Well, it. Jock's side isn't really legitimate, but... You know what I mean, though. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no, there's no side that's like, that, the, like the creators are telling you is evil, as a, as opposed to some other uh, political debates in media. So this I appreciate. What, I, but at the same time, I think in the kind of world we live in now, being this direct about this in, uh, about stuff like this, kind of takes me out of it. I'm watching Ruby to escape, not to see stuff I'm having enough shit with in real life. And I think that's a fair complaint. I, again, like the big thing with, you know, very clearly you the kinda, big... You kind of you 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 cut off, uh, do you think it's a fair complaint or not a fair complaint? No, I think it's a completely fair complaint. I think the big, you know, no. reference to... I think the big reference that Jacques is, you know, used to make within the whole political rally and political thing is, you know, Trump, right? Because that's RT, you know, RT is based in Texas. They live in the U.S. So I think that's their big reference point. So you know, rich person buying into an election essentially and paying off people and cheating to get to the top is definitely on the nose, you know, very much so for many people. And then maybe again, maybe some people just don't see it that way at all. I think that's completely fair. I think <clears throat> if your complaint is, you know, hey, I don't really want to go into a show just to watch that and be reminded of the real world. I think that is a fair complaint to have. I think that is, you know, because you are watching this to escape and seeing something be what feels like that, you know, on the nose and without any kind of subtlety whatsoever that you could maybe hand wave it away a little bit, is, it, you know, it does take you away from that escapism somewhat. And I do get that. I do get how that can be a complaint. I think it does serve a bit of a purpose in regards to kind of what our villains are trying, what our two villains, Watts and Tyrion, are trying to do with this episode but you know it's i i still get where you're coming from i guess you'd say again i think it, it does matter to some small degree but i i do think it is very much and again it's not so as small doing that... this entire, it's not doing this entire thing badly might i add mm -hmm. just, this is probably just a personal nitpick for my end that's it Well, and I and I think that's fair. Okay. I think that's completely fair. Um, but uh, you know, and this kind of leads me to another thing about this episode that uh, we're in episode four. That one thing there's a big thing that's happening to these characters. You know, the characters that we've been with since the first volume. 
and that's that they are officially getting their hunt, uh, huntsman and huntresses uh, license. Yes, we have, if I'm not mistaken, episode four is when we have all the characters finally given, you know, they're you know immediately given by authority of Ironwood. Here's your hunter, here's your hunter's licenses. You've earned it, which is unique and different. You know, yeah, and the, but kind of sudden thing out that, of nowhere. <laughs> but that's the thing. You know what? Uh, I will quickly say this: mm -hmm. that um, you know, I on the one hand, I like it that you know, they, again, this is a big moment for those for these characters. But at the same time, I think the politics, the politic talk took too much out of it because this moment honestly feels like nothing. It also feels like nothing for the characters. Like it's mm -hmm. just, oh, we have our licenses now. Great. And then it's just dropped. Yeah, I can kind of get what you're coming from. Like again, but I think it's kind of meant to be. There's not a big, you know, ceremony like they would normally have. They don't have the time for that. So I do kind of get that. Like this is a small footnote for them at this point because they had, um, you know, again, and the characters do kind of talk about this. We had completely forgotten um, about even I, wanting. I have to mute myself for a quick second, but uh, you keep talking. I'll be right. I'll be back in a few seconds. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I do get where HC is coming from, right? The you know the whole license thing is very quickly ran through, but I, I do feel it's understandable because even our characters kind of say. You know, hey, I had completely forgotten about this. It had, you know, with everything that had been going on, it had slipped my mind. I wasn't even thinking about getting my hunter license anymore at this point. You know, it was just a thing now that I now have, which is cool, but I have bigger priorities, I guess you'd say, with kind of saving the world and everything that's going on there. So I do disagree that, you know, it's completely brushed to the side. I think it's, you know, brushed to the side in the right way and so far in so much as it's just not as important anymore it's not really the focus anymore it's a nice thing for our characters it's a nice moment for our characters but it's just not the focus but you know speaking more of episode four as well it's yeah i i enjoy the small character moments we have with the you know hunter license thing you know we have a small talk between ruby and crow and you know, Crow talks to Ruby about, you know, lying to Ironwood and why she might have done it. And we learn a bit more about Summer as well. And the fact that Summer, you know, her potential death or her disappearance was not an Osmond secret. And, you know, that even Osmond has no clue what happened to Summer and was caught off guard with her disappearance and supposed death, right? Which is a nice little reveal and potential future character development for Ruby and the fact that, you know, maybe Summer is still alive. Maybe she's not. Who knows? Secrets. <laughs> I'm going from there. HC has been muted for more than a bit. Ugh. I'm going from there. You know, we have Watts. Hi, oh. I'm, th I'm sorry about this. Uh, so something, something came up. No. Are you good now? Yeah, I'm, I should be. Should be. Hopefully. Hopefully. But, uh, yeah, what were you talking about? I was finishing up on Talk of the License, and I was saying that, while I, I do understand where you're coming from with this being kind of quickly swept to the side, I do think it makes sense because even our characters talk a bit about how they had completely forgotten about getting their licenses, and it had just been something that had never crossed their mind because they had bigger issues to worry with now, like saving the world and all that. So I do think... Yeah, but again, considering this was their life goal, this is why they, made, they went to Beacon in the first place. It I mean, feels kind of empty. They do celebrate a little bit, though, but I think to them at this point now, it is kind of empty. It's, you know, a nice gesture, but it means very little to them now because they've been through and done so much. It's just not as important to them now. But I do get where you're coming from. Maybe they could have done a bit more, but I think they did exactly what they needed to with it, you know? And, and I also like the smaller moments we got from that scene of, you know, you have Penny jumping up and down in place, and Winter has to put a hand on her to stop her because she's so excited. I like that. It's a small little thing for Penny, which was adorable. Yeah. You yeah, have, Penny. Penny again. I like Penny. She's fine. Yeah. You, know, you you have a you know a really great talk between Crow and Ruby, which we've not had a Crow and Ruby moment for a little while, which was nice to see. 
Although we've never had a crow and yang moment, hardly ever. We need more of those. Like it's been volume three, I think, since we've had a that's, crow and yang that's moment. That's another thing that you know we have. That's another thing I like. You know, the that crow and ruby conversation was really good. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. We got a and bit because of because crow because crow and ruby were always close and mm -hmm. they were always you know a disconnection. Ruby like uh, really thinks the role of crow. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to see to see them actually sit down and have like a legit adult conversation. Again, I like this season for Ruby herself. I think she mm -hmm. really grew. Agreed. And I love, you know, we get a bit about Summer as well. You know, learning that, oh, you know, Summer's disappearance and supposed death wasn't an Osmond thing. It was just a Summer thing that even Oz was surprised with what happened to Summer and that he had no clue. So that's interesting, you know, a bit of backstory there. Suppose maybe Summer is still alive. Maybe she's not. Who knows? I've said all this before. Um, you know, moving on to other things this episode. You know, we have Watts coming to Jacques to help with the election. And we didn't bring this up in the previous episode for episode three, I think it was. Maybe two. I forget exactly when. But what did you think about Watts's, what I think the fandom, or at least parts of the fandom has dubbed, Watts dog moment? You know, the game Watch Dogs with all the hacking and everything. Oh, Watts that's walking what it's supposed to be? I don't know if that's what it's supposed yeah, was, to be, I, but that's think, what the I fandom calls it. About this too. <laughs> I, I was thinking about this too. Um, you know, I, I never really played Watch Dogs, so cool for people who played the game, I think. I, I don't think that was the I intended was... reference, but it definitely kind of feels that way. With Watts just oh, walking I, down the street, well, talking honestly, with Tyrion yeah. on the phone. And yeah, just, well, you know, honestly, hacking different honestly, things. You know, at the same time, you could say Harriet is not supposed to be a Flash or a Sonic reference. But, you know, people are going to make these oh, uh, true, connections. True. And to my credit, you made the Sonic comparison for me. So well, thank you. Someone else pointed the Sonic reference out to me because there's, you know, we didn't talk about it. But there's a shot in episode three of Harriet charging up her speed semblance. And... It has to be done on purpose. There's no way it's not because it's shot. It's almost shot for shot similar to a scene from the Sonic movie trailer, if I'm not mistaken. It's a, it's also in the final movie, it's in which the final is movie. good. Okay. You know, yeah, maybe a great scene, but still it's shot for shot very similar. And like, again, like I think RT does it great for Harriet. I think it works great for Harriet here as well. But it's very similar once you see these two shots side by side. Like if you get a gift set of each... And you see them just kind of go through everything. It's like, that has to be a reference or an homage to. Like, there's no way it's not. No way it's not. It's just too damn similar. You've seen it. What do you think? You know, um, because I went into this with you telling me there's a character you, I must know what you, think, what you think of. And it's like, oh, if Wolf tells me this, this is probably has something to do with like Sonic or something. Mm-hmm. So when I saw it, I'm like, yep, that's what he meant. So, <laughs> I, so I didn't really... But, you know, again, I just like speedsters in general, not mm -hmm. just Sonic. But, uh, uh, but you know, it was fun. I, I, I'm i completely okay with this. You know, if it was done as a reference, then it probably means they have some sort of uh, appreciation for the source material. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Someone definitely a Sonic fan over at RT. A terrible, terrible, terrible Sonic fan. God, they're growing and multiplying and infecting other shows now. What is the world oh. coming to? Oh, you Sonic has influenced <laughs> a lot more than you think, my friend. Oh, I know. Um, back to Ruby though. Um, yeah, we have you know we finish off with Watson, you know, talking to Jacques, and that's it. And I guess yeah. going into episode five, Sparks. I. I did like the montage at the beginning. Yeah, this was fun. I, what did you think about the montage song? I thought it was pretty enjoyable. A nice little fun song. Yeah, the entire, didn't like in it. Gen the entire montage uh, I thought was very good. I don't remember the song, but yeah, mm. I enjoyed it. <clears throat> yeah, this was uh, fun. I Generally, I'm not too big a fan of montages, but I think this one worked out pretty well and was decent enough and gave some, you know... Some amount of, you know, a little bit of character moments and development and kind of showing our characters learning a bit from the Aesops and everything and kind of showing like, hey, the Aesops are, you know, training them because they are, you know, that, you know, they are better. They are, you know, more experienced, things of that nature, which is, you know, a good little rendition there. 
moving on, I think episode five is the episode where we finally see Robin Hill. Yes, this is something I want to bring up. This is uh, this is one of yes, my uh, yes, yes. new favorite, one of my new favorite uh, characters, and you this like has Robin nothing Hill. to. <laughs> yeah, and this has nothing to do with the fact that she is voiced by Christina V. Mm. Okay, it has something to do with it because Christina V is awesome. She is. She's pretty great. I think she does a great job as Robin Hill here. A lot of people yeah. fell in love with her. You know, one of the happy huntresses. The um, I think her name is Thyme. T H Y M E. The sheep girl. A lot of people fell in love with her very quickly. Very yeah. quickly. <laughs> I <laughs> can't say I can't say I'm on the same boat, but good for them. I, again, like Ruby, the Ruby fandom has a big thing with oh, this character has like one line, but her design is amazing. We've fallen in love with her. Give us more, of, more. Give us more of that character. Ruby fandom is very big into just falling in love with a character in one scene or one one line. Just one look at them is all they need. Like there's another Faunus character you see in you know, this volume earlier on within the, on the streets of Mantle that people fell in love with just because like, so get used to that. <laughs> well, good for the people. But yeah, I, I, I liked the, you know, the, the, the standoff between Robin and her happy huntresses and, you know, Ruby, Penny, and Clover, and Crow. And, you know, even before that, you know, while they're traveling in the truck there, we have a nice little moment between Penny and Ruby where, you know, Ruby's about to fall asleep on Penny's shoulder, you know, you're, no, that, as the ship is that's called, actually nuts some, and dolts. That's another thing I like, uh, you know, Ruby and Penny have some, uh, I like their conversations with each other mm -hmm. while they're on the way. Yeah, yeah, Penny has a lot of good stuff this volume, I think. And then we have, you know, Crow and Clover in the back playing cards and them kind of having their conversation and going back and forth and, you know, Clover telling, you know, and Crow being like, well, you know, the kids have done most of the work. I've just been kind of tagging along and being kind of a hindrance, not really teaching them anything. And, you know, Clover tells him like, hey, why do you keep doing that to yourself? And he's, and, and Crow's like, oh, no, I think Clover says something, you know, Crow says something about drinking and Clover says, why do you do that to yourself? And Crow's like, no, 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 I quit. And Clover's like, no, I don't mean the drinking. I mean, why do you keep selling yourself short? You know, don't sell yourself short. These kids depend on you more than you think or believe, right? Which was a nice moment between them and kind of very uplifting for Crow in a way, right? And I enjoyed that. Yeah. Because Crow and needs again, something a little bit decent right now, you know? The dude's been through hell and yeah. back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So it's nice for him to have nice moments like that. And, you know, I think the big thing for episode five is winter. And, you know, again, I loved, you know, we have a, a moment between winter and Weiss training together as well. And them, you know, being sisters. And that was great. I love that. More of that. I love winter. But then we see winter reveals to Weiss that Ironwood chose her to become the new winter maiden. Hello. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a twist I'm half and half about. I mean, it does make sense her name is Winter. You know, the joke went around that, you know, Ironwood looking for the new Winter Maiden, then he sees an application for the Atlas military across his desk, and th that person's name is Winter Schnee, and Ironwood just being like, hot damn, how do you get this lucky? <laughs> Winter Maiden, her name's Winter. So, you know, jokes aside, well, though, I, I, I do get where they're going for. And plus, I think they do throw a curveball later with, you know, who actually does end up becoming the Winter Maiden, which is interesting. And I think plays a part into Winter's character and kind of what the what this volume is getting at by the end of it, I feel. <clears throat> but overall, you know, a good a, a good kind of montage episode that starts to really set the theme, you know, the kind of tone for the, for what's to come up next throughout the volume. I feel, you know, it kind of sets us in like, okay, you know, this is, you know, we're in Atlas now, we're in Mantle now, we're doing our thing here. Yeah. So, moving on. So episode, this is the kind of episode I'm okay with. And considering what, what the show went for. And 
And you know, I, I, in considering how how di difficult stuff has become, you know, all the you know <clears throat> all the political stuff, and I, I do well, like that. We should point get, out, you know, episode six is the political rally episode. Yeah, but at the same time, that's really not like the characters can get a day off and actually have fun. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate it that, you know, we don't really, you know, we get some of it because, you know, this is the results being about to be announced. And again, this yeah. episode is kind of predictable with how it ends because mm -hmm. as soon as I saw that screen with the results, I'm like, yep, something <laughs> is going to happen with the results. <laughs> but Shit. I did enjoy. I do enjoy, you know, the, you know, at least Ruby, Noah, and Ren getting to actually hang out a bit together uh, because what did you think uh, about? We don't see what did uh, you... about uh, Noah, Noah, and Ren. Uh, I'm okay with this. Oh, what did sure, you think about the not? kiss? Right, you know, do you think that was well yeah. done for them or no? Um, you know, it's fine. Uh, I I don't have glaring issues with it, but at the same time, I don't have any. I wasn't like. Oh my God! It's happened. Uh, no, it, it, it's fun. Though. That's fair. I, I think Ren and Nora had a lot of interesting moments. Something you know that we didn't pick up on. I think it was in an earlier episode. You know, we have Nora blow up at Ironwood just in the middle of a conversation, and you know, talking about how she's tired of secret keeping and she just doesn't care for it anymore, and all the line, which is interesting to hear from her, and and, and yeah. it kind of goes back to something we'll see a little bit. Later on, that I'll again bring up on another in a later episode. Um, something I do want to point out for this episode: What did you, you, you know, you talk about how Yang and Blake not, you know, kind of having that awkward phase you disliked. So I'm curious: Yang and Blake have a moment here where you know they're you know planning on going to a dance club, and you see a little bit of them dancing, and how Blake apparently dances horribly, and Yang dances all right. You know, so I'm interested: Is that more of what you're looking for? Because it's not necessarily an awkward phase. I feel like that's just them being what the I'm characters they are together. Was see, what I'm looking for was seeing them at said club. We didn't ah. get that at all. That's fair. That's fair. A again, I personally don't care for seeing that. I think that would have taken away, but I, you're not the only one that wanted to see that, though. So I do get and, that. And, you know, it's not necessarily just uh, Black and Yen, uh, and Yen honestly. It's just, you know, because we see what Ruby, Noah, and uh, Ren are up to during mm -hmm. this. Uh, but then again, we also have like uh, Jean and Weiss and, uh, you know, Askel going to the movies. And it's like, you know, if we are going to have like the, the fun evening episode, like we get a day off, why not show everyone, not just focus on one group? Well, to be because... fair, Ruby's group kind of ends up in the middle of, you know, a bad situation, and their situation is, yeah, I guess, more I plot it. important. Showing the other stuff is, while fun, not definitely not plot important. Though I would have enjoyed getting to see why John and Oscar together, because Oscar definitely does not get a lot of moments to really be himself or show off his character past being, oh, he's just Ozpin's, you know, new body, essentially. Like, that's kind of Oscar's character at the moment. It took, I feel, this volume until we kind of got a bit more of individual character from Oscar. But even that's, again, becomes more and more overshadowed by, oh, he's just Ozpin's new body. You know, it, it, again, it just becomes more and more overshadowed by that, which is kind of annoying for this character i feel like it's you know hey we have oscar what about oscar not osman oscar we just don't get enough of that which would have been nice but i don't think it's necessary to see them at the movies or the club also i'm one of those people who consistently throughout this show i talked about how i hope they never have an actual bees you know romantic moment with blake and yang because I hope they just continue to have this will they want they tease for the entirety of Ruby's run. You just never know, and they just never confirm it one way or the other. I hope they do that. I so hope they do that. Because I'm a terrible, evil person. But I just want to see the bees squirm. <laughs> because you just have this constant, oh my god, why? Will they? Won't they? Because I'm an evil person. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Because teasing the bees is fun. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get stung to death, but it's still fun. 
Um, you have your kinks, and I respect that. <laughs> Fair enough. That's all I'm going to say regarding that idea. Fair but, enough. Uh, the, the, the idea of you being stung by bees all the time. But, um, but yeah, back okay. to episode six. You know, we have the political rally. We have Ren and Nora kiss. We have, you know, Penny and Mero at the political rally, and shit goes down. You know, shit goes down. I love how. Penny... I, I, you know, a small thing. I love how they use. You know, you talked about the screen with the results at the background in the background. I love how, as things are going on, you constantly see that screen in the background, and you see Robin at such a high number, and you see Jacques slowly ticking up further and further and further to where they're closer and closer and closer and neck and neck. And then, right as they're neck and neck, right at the end, that's when everything goes to shit. You know, the lights go off, and Tyrion shows up, and he starts. Killing some fools. Left and right, left, right, and center. And then you have Watts in the background being the most over the top hacking motherfucker ever. <laughs> with all of the music and just all the different, you know, movements with, you know, him hacking phones and just kind of hacking the drones that are flying around in the in that place and everything. And just trying to get shots of everything. It's just ridiculous. Absolutely yeah, ridiculous. Time. And that was, and also, I, I'm not sure about necessary about the entire. You know, suddenly Penny is to blame for all of this. Right? Yeah, a lot of people I did get have it. problems with it. They feel it wasn't done very well. They feel they felt that it was, you know, like, hey, why are people making such stupid decisions logically? But I think you know you have to remember it is the heat of the moment and stuff like that, right? Um, yeah, it's a, it's one of those, you know, just because we have a robot doesn't mean the robot did it. I get where you're coming from, but I think they set it up well enough to say, like, you know, as for why people would accuse Penny, right? Yeah, but at the same time, there's a difference between accusing and saying she did it. And it felt like it jumped really quickly into she did it. Well, well, it's worth, you know, noting that, you know, they... All of that was done so they could make it look like Penny did do it, right? You know, they had, you know, the footage that Watts edited to make it look like it was Penny and everything. Again, like again, I, I get where you're coming from in so much as you know it's it's been done before, I suppose, and it's kind of played out. But at the same time, I think it's done well enough here that I can you know kind of say, all right, you know, it's fine. Yeah. If you get me. Well, yeah, I get you. It's uh, it's just a thing, I guess. But um, you know, we end. Uh, any thoughts on episode six specifically? That you know, you know, it's a, it was a fun episode. I have a bit of an F about the ending, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, we we do end off. You know, our ending is apparently there's a grim invasion. You know, a grim yeah. invasion is coming into Mantle, and so our characters head off to fight that. And then that's when we end up in episode seven, where the Grim Invasion is suppressed, and we didn't get to see any of that. A lot of people disliked that about Episode 7, yeah. how it kind of, you know, this is a thing that happened. Okay, you know, moving on from that. We don't get to see that fight. I think I get it, though. I think, again, it goes kind of back to that, you know, the Grim Invasions are just there as a background thing. They're not really the important part to what's going on. They're just a constant threat that we always have to worry about. Mm -hmm. Which I kind of liked. I, I think was fine. I don't need to see them always fight the Grim, I feel. Yeah, I don't need to, to see them fight all the time. Like, I know, again, based on this season and previous one, I know they can handle themselves against, against the Grim. So mm -hmm. it didn't really bother me. And But uh, then we have episode seven. Mm -hmm. And episode seven is, you know, hey, Ironwood, you know, Robin and her happy huntresses have gone to stealing more supplies from Atlas and the military. So Ironwood orders for Robin to be caught and Tyrion to be found. And... and this is the point again where I'm saying that that you know keeping your your cards up to your chest from some people is not the way to go because there's the entire thing that you know Blake and the Yang are, ch are chasing Robin, and then they tell her exactly what Ironwood is planning. Well, they don't tell her exactly has, what he's planning. They just tell him Ironwood's not there, not her. Still, you know, they still, still keep some close. They still they still keep exactly what he's doing, 
close to their chest. But but at the same time, it it, it is some Iron Mood would wouldn't even do that, and that's and that's my thing that you know when after they tell her, listen, it's not the enemy, and she has the this is actually a cool power that she has her semblance is pretty cool that she can actually detect lies mm -hmm. uh, like that. It's neat, but, very neat semblance. Uh, yeah, uh, so I like that, but at the same time, there's the entire thing that you know later on when I, Iron Wood actually. And discovers that what Black and, y and Yang did, he's all of a sudden mad about it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, no, you shouldn't. Again, you have a common enemy. Use well, the fact, use that fact. Again, though, I think it's worth pointing out, you know, in that situation, it's understandable why he's mad. It's understandable, you know, you can understand where he's coming from because in that situation, He's not thinking clearly. He's not thinking straight. You know, he is very much he at that point in the in the volume. He has kind of fallen to that fear and paranoia of his, right? Yeah, but at the same but at the same time, this is something that you need to take into account. That if you want people to trust you, you need to trust them as well. And again, I, I so think, I it's mean, and again, it's not that he needs to tell her her his entire plan. Just that. You have something. Like, don't chase her around. Don't send your soldiers after her. Just tell her what's going on. And I think many people would agree with you, but you know, it, it is worth keeping in mind. You know, kind of the opposite thought to that, as far as Ironwood is concerned. In that, he again the paranoia, the worry that you know Salem has instilled in him, and you kind of see this in what. I don't remember if it's a later episode or an earlier episode, but, you know, you kind of have this moment where, you know, Ironwood shows Oscar the vault where the new relic is kept, the spear, right? And you know, the relic the relic of creation, if I'm not mistaken, the spear. And, you know, you have Ironwood walk over to the elevator console and then you see this flashback of, the you know, the black chess piece sitting on the screen and, Ironwood kind of flashing back to, you know, and red lights going off and everything, and Ironwood flashing back to that moment where he felt the least, you know, he felt the most powerless. He felt like everything had conspired against him, and he had completely lost everything and let everyone down due to his own foolishness and mistakes. And so it's understandable that, you know, he's more easily able to fall to paranoia and, you know, that fear of, not being able to trust anyone around him because he's completely unsure if they really and truly are allies. I don't know. I don't buy it. I'm, I know what you're what you're saying. Not buying it. I get you that. Need Again, some it's... Trust in, you need some trust in order to, you know, pull something like this off. I, I do think... Well, again, and I think that's the reason why it fails because, you know, it is worth pointing. You know, this does fail. Everything kind of goes to shit at the end. Very much so. And it's very much because people didn't trust one another at the very beginning. Like, you know, people kept secrets from each other. And I think that is why this failed. And it's, you know, it is worth pointing out that this does fail. That all of their plans, yeah. as of now, at the end of Volume and 7, again, do this, fail. And again, this goes back to what I said at the beginning. Because this fails, on who's to, uh, who's to blame for it is a different story that... I think kind of you, you can know, blame everyone. Everyone's at fault for this yeah. failing. They everyone's, all have their own, yeah, they all have their own part to Yeah, play. you know, but at the same, what I'm saying is that no matter who you decide to fault more, this brings us back to what I said at the beginning. This season doesn't go anywhere. I don't think we're any closer to stopping Salem. When we spent the entire season having this plan that might work, and all of a sudden this happens, and then I'm like, wait, so what did we accomplish here? Actually, uh, I, I just think, think th and and I think that you know, and the sad thing is that you know, I it, when I start to think about it, and I reach some, and I'm saying that, and I reach the conclusion that if some people just talk to each other and were honest. We would have, maybe something else would have happened. I don't know, like, I think that's again, I know. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I agree with you. I think that's a completely fair assessment. I think, you know, it'll be interesting to go into volume eight, right? Looking at volume seven and just how. I, I do agree with you, kind of how it's. It, it does feel a little 
unfinished and like very little was accomplished. And I think that is because it's more set up for volume eight. More so than I feel any other Ruby volume has been in the past. I think volume seven is definitely going to depend on volume eight to either a small or large degree in terms of when you watch it, when you go and watch volume eight, you come back and watch volume seven. I think it's going to change a lot of minds and opinions, right? I just, you know, if volume eight kind of goes into a lot of the stuff, volume seven leaves undone and unsaid and just kind of sitting there for now, when we get done with volume eight and come back, I think it's definitely going to play a large part in, okay, I can see where they were going with everything in volume seven. Now I like maybe, it more or maybe I can see where they were something... going with everything in volume seven now. And I like it less. I think it's going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of I... moves. <laughs> no, I no because I will say you know you say volume eight and maybe come coming back to this will change something you know probably, mm -hmm. but at the same time if I need to wait on a on another season to appreciate this then I'm sorry it's not good writing and I think that's completely fair and I would completely it's one hundred percent agree the, it's, with that yeah so I get what you mean but at the same time if I if I need to wait a season then eh. I completely agree with you there. Like, I'm in the same boat as that. I think we still have to look at Volume 7 for what it is now and judge it for what it is now. Even if Volume 8 changes my opinion later, my opinion of Volume 7 is still that I think... I, I, again, I think, you know, Volume 7 does move too fast for its own good. A, pro a consistent problem with Ruby. A and I'm curious, you know, consider we talked earlier about how we felt that Episode 3 is when Volume 7 really starts, so that means you only have 10 episodes, really, for Ruby. If you start at epi if Volume 7 starts at Episode 3, and there's 13 episodes, that means your first... Well, you know, 11, 11 episodes. Uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7... Yeah, 11. Sorry, I'm no good at math. I'm terrible. <laughs> but yeah, 11 episodes, so... It's it's interesting because if that's the case and that's how you wish to view it, that's, if I'm not mistaken, one of the shortest volumes of Ruby we've had so far. Which, if that's how you choose to look at it and view it, definitely, you know, leaves a lot unsaid and undone. Mm -hmm. And is an interesting way to look at things. And not something that I had really thought about or considered for before. Yeah. But it does kind of put things into some perspective, I feel. But getting back to episode talk, I wanted to specifically ask you about Blake and Yang's conversation in episode six. What did you think about that? Seven, because I know maybe. you... Uh, yes, seven. My, my apologies. Uh, about their conversation in episode seven, you know, what did you think about that? Because I know you talked about earlier about, you know, the moments between them feeling more, a bit more fan servicey, but I felt this conversation. Okay. The, well, no, no, on. no. And when I say, when I say that some, I mean some of them, not all of them. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. But but uh, I was curious about I this will, conversation but, specifically know, because no, this, this one is more linked back to what they dealt with with Adam, right? Yeah, but so this conversation I appreciate because again, this is something you know both of them took on Adam together. Adam is a big part of Blake's past. This mm -hmm. is the kind of conversation. I I like because you know they're actually developing as characters. We don't need we don't need the entire awkward flirting phase again. This is That's this fair. is building a connection through conversation, mm -hmm. kind of like what the kind of like you know what the previous volumes did. I think that's completely fair. Um. You know, we definitely, and finally with episode seven, I think the big thing is, you know, we learn a bit more about how Penny was created and we find out that Pietro has been essentially cutting pieces of his own aura of, away from himself to give to Penny, which is mm -hmm. interesting to learn about aura in that way, because it's not something that we thought was possible before, especially considering aura is supposedly linked to one's own soul, right? So it, it's yeah. interesting to think about that. And again, I think this comes back into play with Penny being kind of the Pinocchio stand-in and reference, right? In so much as, you know, 
you know, you know, what is her soul if it comes from someone else, right? And, you know, is she truly, you know, a real girl or is she, you know, a lot of questions about, you know, transgender came up with this episode in regards to Penny somewhat from some people in, you know, considering Pietro's soul, you know, you know, is that a, you know, is, you know, considering since Pietro is male, you know, is his soul that way? Is Penny's soul that way? A lot of different interesting questions there that I don't think the show intended to try and answer or even bring yeah, up, but this is it's interesting to talk about. Definitely, yeah, this is definitely something that, you know, is fandom, is very much fan, fandom. fans interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it's interesting. And it, I think it's worth at least bringing up here to say, you know, that was interesting to see the fandom take that route with it and go down that line of questioning of what does that mean and how interesting to them that is and how interesting it was to read from someone kind of outside of the realm of, you know, transgender people and not having a lot of reference or um, experience with that, right? It was interesting to see and read for me, so that's why I bring it up, I guess. Yeah. But any other thoughts on episode seven? No, not really. No, episode eight. Are we, you know, we start with... This is, you know, our party episode, and yes. I just want to say, I'm so, I'm so glad that cake fell on something, <laughs> on someone. It was intentionally made to do that, but yeah, I do get what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, we have Whitley Bean. I being... don't really, <laughs> have, I don't yeah. really have an, a lot to say about this, but uh, again, I, you know, for again for such a political season, I enjoyed the politic talk. For all its worth. I loved Willow. Episode 8 is where we get to see Willow, Weiss's mom, for the first time, and I yeah. loved her. Yeah, this one, this was a good moment. I, I like that, you know, she's not just uh, the husband's bitch. She's actually... Yeesh. I get why you say that, but yeesh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get why I say that, so I don't have to explain myself. No, uh, but, again... Uh, but again, I do appreciate the fact that you know she is, you know, she is she is actually legit trying to help, and in her she's own way, not, yeah. yeah, and yeah, I I like I like her. She's not there for a long for a long time, but she left an impact, a good but one. I, I do love right how she talks about, you know, I I love the moment of you know you see her take a you know because Willow's very much gone to drink right she's very much an alcoholic like crow was yeah and she drinks all the time and i love how you see her take a swig from the giant bottle she has with her of alcohol and you, know, you kind of see weiss just kind of look off to the side and you, you you know you see willow notice her through the glass and it's kind of like she then stops and says okay here i need to help you out a little bit so here like you can see that weiss wants to say something about how she should stop drinking about how she should get away from this but at the same time she doesn't know how to say it. You know, you can see the relationship between her and her mother and how they do both care about one another, how Willow does care about her kids because she does say, you know, hey, I had cameras put up everywhere in this house, right? Because we find out that Willow had a camera that taped Watson Jock's conversation with one another together. And, you know, she talks about how I put up cameras everywhere in this house because I was worried in case we ever needed to do anything or say anything. And, you know, you can see that you know, there was a hope and a strength to Willow that was just slowly eroded and faded over time with, you know, the abuse from her husband. And I think that's just great, you know, and you can see how, as you see Willow and you see... It's great that you see her rebelling against him and not that she was abused. We should clarify that. Yeah, again, it's not just that. It's great to see that, you know, you you can tell each of Weiss, Winter, Whitley, and Willow's kind of reactions to being abused you know you have if i'm not mistaken people said you know you have oh, i wish i could remember what it was talked about specifically in the words that were used but you know there's like different reactions to being abused someone who runs away from it someone who becomes who tries to be that perfect person for the abuser right like they try and i don't want to say suck up but they try and be that person that the abuser wants them to be, even though they're never going to be able to achieve that level of perfectness that the abuser wants. And you have, you know, Willow who has her way of dealing with abuse and how she reacts to it and everything. Like it's way better put out in thought than what I'm saying right now. I just cannot remember the words they used and I do not remember where to quickly look up to find it, but it's all great and interesting 
conversation was. And um, mm-hmm. I loved also for this episode the talk between Winter and Penny, where you know Winter tells Penny, "Oh, you just wouldn't get it," and Penny's you know kind of talks to her about, you know, you're right, I I don't get it because it feels like, you know, you shouldn't hide away from you. Know, Winter's trying to, you know, she's Winter's chastising herself for letting her emotions show, and for not keeping her emotions in check. And Penny, you know, comes up and tells her, "Well, you're right, I don't get that. I think you should be." more into your emotions and let your emotions come out and stand up for, you know, your emotions and yourself more. It's an interesting discussion between the two of them, and it's a nice moment for both of them as well. It kind of shows that Winter and Penny are a little bit close, really, in their own way, even though they're kind of not. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Again, just, there's a lot of nice small stuff here, right? Like with, you know, Willow especially telling Weiss that, you know, you know, Whitley, you know, you should come back and do something for Whitley. You know, don't forget Whitley. And Weiss is like, well, why? Whitley hates me. And she, Willow's like, yeah, because you left him alone with me and your father. Of course he hates you for that. You know, which is really, really like, damn. <laughs> like, that's good, though. Like, you know, a lot of people kind of came into Whitley like, oh, he's going to be this evil little shit and just terrible. And it's like, well, no. Yeah, Whitley may not be perfect. He has his own faults. But at the same time, he's still just as much a victim as Weiss, Winter, and Willow are. And let's not forget that. I think that's great coming from them. Thanks. Hopefully that didn't pick up on mic. That was a bad sound in the background. Um, Moving on. Something, but uh, yeah, sorry about that. Moving on to episode nine. Why I will say this right away. Why has such a badass moment here when she actually when she arrests her father. Mm-hmm. A lot of people love the. <laughs> Can I do that? <laughs> like Jacques Schnee, you're under arrest. It's like, wait, can I do that? Looking back at her, no, that was a great moment. That was just fun. I I completely agree. But um, yeah, we have you know Jacques. You know Jacques is revealed that. Watts apparently has access to all their systems because of Jacques, but Jacques had no idea Watts was going to basically screw everything up because Jacques had no idea that what how evil Watts was and what he was there to really do. And, you know, we have, you know, a whole thing of that and Jacques getting called out for it and arrested. And we see Whitley upset, you know, by this a little bit and Willow kind of looking back and that. But then we go into, I guess, the more important stuff, which is... Ironwood and Robin kind of announce, you know, everyone trying to save, you know, people from the Grim and evacuate people. And Ironwood and Robin come on screen to tell them to finally say, you know, the truth. And they're like, this is the big episode where everybody's revealing the truth to everybody, essentially. You know, we have Ruby and Oscar having their awkward moment with one another and their kind of adorable, you know, way. And, you know, Oscar decides, hey, Ironwood needs to know the truth about Salem, that she is immortal and more of her backstory and, you know, what's going on with him and Ah. Him and Oz, exactly, and everything that's going on there. And just everyone's telling everyone the truth, essentially. <laughs> this is that episode. And, you know, again, like, I think they do really well with, you know, we've kind of been at this low point for our heroes, where they, uh, they've been doing their jobs and everything's kind of gone well enough, but it's not been going as well as it could or should be. And this kind of feels like that high point of everything's finally coming together. Everyone's telling each other the truth, and, you know, we have... You know, the next episode after this, everyone kind of goes after the bad guys and we have, you know, all that happening. And it feels like these next two and three episodes partially are the, the you know, the, the high point for our heroes. Yeah, this is, this is the high point before stuff starts going into shit. Yeah, completely crushing it. But I think this is done really well here, personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we have kind of our low moment of mantles in a riot because the heat's off and everyone's afraid and scared and worried, but then all of a sudden, and it's being overrun by Grimm, but then all of a sudden you have, you know, Ironwood and Robin come on like, hey, we're telling the truth and we're using Robin's semblance to show that we're telling the truth. But in actuality, we're not telling the truth, though, at all. Because Ironwood lies about the Amity Coliseum project being finished to lure out Watts. But uh, that's kind of more of a episode ten and eleven thing. So, yes, but, I guess you know ten, episode ten. I don't really have a lot of info, but uh, episode ten we get to see. You know, if I'm not mistaken, 
that's the episode, yeah, where we have Tyrion going after Robin, and we see Robin, Crow, Clover, and, Tyr- and Tyrion fight each other, which I think was really yeah. great to see, which was a yeah, lot of fun. Uh, yeah, episode 10 <laughs> has had a lot of great action. We also, I should mention, episode 9, what did you think about the little reveal of, oh, Cinder and Neo are here, and we get to see Neo this little skip in episode Honestly, 9. Honestly, this was And she was, was there with that an... conversation. This was so out of nowhere. Yeah. I think it was a good out of nowhere, though, personally. Yeah, you know, it was a twist, but at the same time, it's like, oh, you are here. Why are we only seeing you now? I I think, again, like, the big focus here is Watts and Tyrion, right? And them as villains and what all they're doing. And to kind of show the level difference between them and, say, Cinder and her plotting and planning. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. I think it's to give them their spotlight because if Cinder and Neo were just here, then it'd be more focused on them. Well, that's not good. Silence you. Sorry about that. That's, All the that's noises. I'm taking over the podcast. I'm trying to, anyways. We'll just put that on mute for a bit. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it does well for what it is and kind of shows them off now in their final moments of you know they're here now as well and doing their thing. It's interesting, but um. I guess getting into more of episode 10, what do you think of the Crow, Clover, Robin, and Tyrion fight? It's a good fight. I'm not sure if I'm 100% about the, each other's motivations because why would Crow all of a sudden team up with this guy to start? No, 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 no. Too far ahead. We're in episode 10. This is when they capture Tyrion the first time. Oh, okay. In that case, it's a cool fight. <laughs> Again, episode 10, episode, my notes for episode 10 now, great action. That's yeah, really that's fair. all I have to say. I mean, that's what episode 10 is. It's very much action show. So, yeah, I think that's fair. But moving on to episode 11, the Ironwood and Watts fight. Hmm. What did you think about that? That was good. That was great. I'll admit, I did not expect Watts to pull out a, you know, a 20 shot gun and say like, Hey, I'm not going to go down without a fight, bitch. Let's do this. Like that was, yeah. I'll admit I didn't and expect also, Watts to be a fighter, is, but it was this, like, we don't great. Really that's great. See, and also we don't really see a lot of hand to hand combat in this show. So it was fun to see them mm. go a bit hand to hand. It was a lot more close and personal between these two, which was fun to see. And I loved how, you know, you have the, oh, I forget the name of the song, but you have Ironwood's song that comes in. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's Ironwood's voice actor that's singing that song as well, which is really great and really well done. But everything about that fight, there's a lot of movement in that fight. There's a lot of, you know, back and forth in that fight and just you know, Watts constantly counting down his shots the entire time. A lot of great stuff within that fight goes on. I think that's probably one of the best fights we've seen from Ruby in quite some time, if at all. I think that's probably mm-hmm. going to go down as as of now, one of my favorite Ruby fights, the fight between Watts and Ironwood. And it's, yeah, that was a great fight. And it's solely based on just the weapons and hand-to-hand and aura. There's not even a bit of semblance usage in this fight, which is interesting to see. Mm-hmm. But, you know, yet Gravity, you know, you know, episode 11 ends. You know, we have everything's coming together. Everyone's kind of doing their thing. We've gotten Tyrion arrested. We've gotten Watts arrested. And at the end of it, we see, oh, wait. Cinder's here. You know, Ironwood has yeah. been left a chest piece on his desk, and he's immediately back into that paranoia driven, okay, I thought I was doing good. I thought everything was okay. I thought we'd finally gotten ahead, and wait, no, we're not even remotely ahead. There's still multiple steps ahead of us. We're still playing catch up with them. Mm-hmm. And he falls once more uh, into that paranoia. And this annoyed me. This really? like uh, yeah because when Ironwood falls into the paranoia again, this was like oh shut the hell up. I you disagree. Are just as to blame for you are just as to blame for all of this. Oh no, he is. But I, I again, I can see where Ironwood's coming from in the fact that how he falls into that paranoia so quickly and easily. You know, for him again, that that is a part of his issue. You know, that is you know very much. Going back to that PTSD he suffers from the first time this happened to him, it, it's very much, you know, I can see where he's coming from. I understand where he's coming from. And I think that sells it more, personally. But that's just me, though. 
Well, I don't know. This just felt like we need. We have two more episodes to fill the season. We need conflict. Let's um have Ironwood throw a fit and go after Team Ruby now. Well, I think you know it's. I, I get where you're coming from, but I think at the same time it does kind of lean into that more idea of Salem doing her level best to pit humanity against one another. Though at the same time, I guess. This isn't really Salem had nothing to do with this. This was all their own doing. But I, I think that too, in its own way, is kind of indicative of how humanity can be at fault sometimes for its own destruction. How, you know, we will, when faced with world ending events or just terrible things that can happen, we'll still fight amongst ourselves at times and we'll still screw ourselves over, even though we know there's something more important to be worried about, something that's way more important to deal with, we're still focused on petty squabbles. I think that's interesting, right? And I think it kind of goes back to this volume's theme of, you know, trusting in one another and be open with one another and the idea of, you know, with the, with the main intro song being, you know, love and things like that and trust. You know, I think it kind of goes back to that being the theme of this volume, really. Yeah. But, um... Looking at episode 11, we have, I loved, 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 loved Salem's entrance for episode 11. You know, yeah. I, I also love the fact that Watts was apparently carrying one of those seers around in that bag the entire time, <laughs> which is just funny. Well, always be prepared. He just had this grim seer with him the entire time, which was ridiculous. But, you know, and you see it come out in the office and you see it, you know, basically die. And then Salem comes up in a corporeal form and it's like, oh, honey. Watts and Tyrion weren't here to destroy you. They were just the opening act for me. Which is like, damn. And Salem, you know, again, like you hear Ruby stand up to Salem and it's, she just destroys her with, you know, your mother said that to me and just pulling out the yo mom card. <laughs> which was, again, I loved that scene though, the back and forth between Ruby and how well done, you know, I think her name is Lindsay for, Ruby, for Ruby's VA. She did great here with Ruby's VA work yeah. and the crying and everything, and just how distraught she felt and how distraught Salem again, made her. One of, again, one of the stronger points of this season is Ruby herself. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, Ruby, Ironwood, and Penny kind of steal this season character wise, I feel, in terms of all their different character moments. Do you agree? Disagree? Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I loved the the parallels between seeing, you know, Ruby Silver Eyes kind of trying to activate and failing to activate, and you kind of see the, you know, volume six, we saw the ending of it, and we saw kind of that place and that thought that Ruby goes to of her mom being that kind of aspiration aspiration to of things to protect and love and care for, right? And that's how she activates her silver eyes. And you see that same scene, that same image from before where it was bright sunshine and you know, clear blue skies and very colorful to this episode where you see that same image and it's dark gray skies and overcast and cloudy and it's darker and the grass is more dull and gray and you see a more pensive looking summer. I love that. I think that was some great parallels and extremely well done stuff there. And then finally we see the Aesop's fight with this episode, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, episode uh, 12 starts. With, no. Uh, this is, yeah, episode no. 12 is when the Aesop's fight starts. And, you know, episode 11, we see Oscar is missing as well because apparently Neo has gone after Oscar and the, the lamp. You know, we get a bit of that. And, you know, you know episode and 11. Again, starts. I don't really have. This is something that sounds that, you know, for episodes 12 and 13, I don't have much notes because, again, they're mostly action. Good action. I just oh, yeah. didn't have much well, note. I but, disliked uh, the Ruby Aesop's fight, and I'm still, hmm. I'm very half and half on this because, yeah, you know, there's people who say this is great setup, and you know, everything about this works perfectly with all the rest of the volume setup, and it's set up perfectly, and you know, the Ruby Aesop's fight. It makes perfect sense that Ruby would be able to beat Aesop's, and I don't disagree with that. But I feel, for me personally, I will you know, say, I will say, before you go along yourself, I will say that you know the idea that you know all of them are saying like, do you really think like uh, do you really think you can be the best? And Ruby actually says, hey, you know, 
you were the best until you trained. Mm -hmm. This is the badass line. Oh yeah, that's I, great. That's a great will, line from. Herbie. I will give. I, I will give. Agree. I will give them that. It's the an fight amazing itself, line. The fight itself, uh, you know, it it is. It does look like a uh, team Ruby at least have something that uh, they don't, and that's you know they know each other personally and they team know work. how each other yeah. works. Yeah, the team the team works works better for team Ruby. Then because again, they're closer I friends. think. Yeah, because they treat each the other's time, family and the Aesops don't. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, but I, I get that, but at the same time, Team Aesops is also, you know, it has been training for years. So. So, um, for me. And maybe, you know, something, if this, if this, you know, if this uh, happened in like a future volume, maybe. I could have, uh, maybe I could have accepted it more. But here, I st can still accept it, but it's like, oh, we need this because we decided we need it. So, for me, I think my issue is, is I don't, you know, I, again, I don't think it's, for me, I think this fight is somewhat unearned. And I, when I say that, I don't mean unearned for the characters, for Ruby. I think this fight is unearned for me as a viewer. And what I mean by that is, I just, I don't feel this fight should have happened now, in episode 12. And I don't feel episode 13 should have happened when it happened. I feel like we should still be dealing with Atlas and Mantle's issues, and that this fight should have happened a bit later. A little bit later on. Not much later on, but a little bit later on. Like, this fight should have been an episode or two from now, and that, you know, we should still be doing with back and forth with everything between these two groups. And that, or that this fight happens now, and that we have another fight between these two groups later on, potentially. And that we're dealing with, you know, humanity's problems with one another and infighting and squabbling before Salem arrives, right? I feel like, as a viewer, to me, there should be something more here that's just not here, I feel. Personally, that's my opinion. And that's why I went and said much earlier on in this episode, I talked a bit about how I feel the finale moves too fast for its own good. And I think this is part of that reason as to why. And I think as I've talked with you here, I've become a little bit more and more solidified into that when I've heard some of the things you've brought up in regards to Volume 7, like saying that, you know, Episode 3 is really the starting point and Episode, you know, and Volume 7 technically only having, if you look at it that way, 11 episodes to work with. Potentially. I think that's interesting, and I think that kind of goes right along with why I feel this volume moves too fast for its own good again. But that's just me, though. Um, yeah, but, um, but again, not. it's still a fun fight. Oh yeah, absolutely, I agree. Like, it's a fun fight to watch. I have nothing wrong, I don't see anything wrong with the animation or the fight itself. I'm just looking at it from a character and story perspective, and I feel, for me personally, I'm not sure it's been earned yet from a character yeah, and story and perspective, then, from like my viewing of it, from the writing of it. I feel like yeah. there should be like I said, more there before that this. In, if this was something that happened in a later volume, maybe. Heal a bit too much. Fair enough. What did you think about, you know, moving on, we have Oscar and... You know, Jean, Nora, and Ren fighting Neo. What did you think about that? I think that was, you know, again, a somewhat more fun action. You know, we could see more uh, from yeah, Neo, I suppose, if you enjoy Neo. We could see Oscar do a few things in this fight as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something I also that I do like Oscar and how he doesn't necessarily need Ospin, you know, to. Be Oscar old. is, as of now, the only person to ever land a hit on Neo, besides Cinder, yeah. I think. Oscar is the first to land a hit on Neo. With the longest punch. Just, no! Running up, running up, running up, running up, running up, then hits Neo. Like, all the time in the world for her to dodge, and she just never does. Which was kind of funny. But I think, yeah. you know, the big fight is Cinder versus Penny and Winter. Yeah, and this... Kind of leads us because I think it happens in this episode it's, where yeah, it Penny... starts, you know, episode 12, you know, the fight with Cinder and 
Neo and uh, Sender, Penny and Winter is starts in episode 12, but very much goes into episode 13. And we're going to kind of talk about but, episode 12 and 13 as a two-parter because it more or less is yeah. really. But I will say this because the point that I'm really like, writers, what are we doing? Is when all of a sudden, you know, because Winter um, asks uh, Penny to, you know, escort her while she takes over the Winter, the winter Maiden world. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, Penny kind of takes over it. Mm-hmm. This was the point where I did that I didn't get. This was the mm-hmm. point where I'm like, writers, what are the rules you set for? Because they do say that in order to take over the maiden role, you need to like practice and prove yourself. And in this case, winter is caring for the winter maiden. And you know well, there is and there is kind of an explanation as to why, because you know she is related to the whole thing. And all of a sudden, so and all of a sudden, you have Penny, who's been, for my, to my knowledge, not programmed with any of this stuff. He just take over the role. So, so what are the rules here? Can Ruby take over another a, a maiden role? Can yes. Yang? Can Blake? Y- Yang can. Blake can. Any any female can. I think you know the the biggest rule they've set up now is that you don't really need practice or training to take over. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. The maiden role. Then, the only... then in this case, if there are no rules to this, why can't all the main characters just become the maidens and kick Salem's ass? One, because no one apparently wants to watch or, or write that, I guess. But two, the reason, you know, they then can't... I'm, then, oh, but, but let me stop you here. You say this, this is, this is bad writing. You know, in a fantasy world, you need to establish this kind of stuff. Well, I, they have, though. Again, let, let, let me finish. They've established okay. that in order for the maiden, you know, powers to tra- you know, the maiden powers transfer to any young girl under a certain age. Like they've established that, and the young girl it transfers to either has to be in the maiden's thoughts as she's dying, or it transfers to just any random young girl. So, say, you know, for instance, Raven we know is the spring maiden, I think, yeah. So, or the summer maiden, whichever one of the two, spring maiden, I think it is. Raven is the Spring Maiden. So say Raven dies and Yang all of a sudden gets Spring Maiden powers. Well, that means Yang was the last person in you know, Raven's thoughts as she died. That's how that would transfer over. Or it just transfers to anyone randomly. As for Penny getting the powers here, you know, we, we, we see Freya, the Winter Maiden, kind of doing her Winter Maiden power thing and nobody's able to get close because of the ice powers. Penny's the only one who's able to get close. But it's not because she's a robot. You know, she was still getting frozen as well. I think the idea here is that Winter and Cinder are both, you know, Cinder more so than Winter, but Winter's still very cold, very not willing to be open or friendly with anyone. She's still very closed off emotionally. Penny isn't. And I think the idea is, you know, the Winter Maiden recognizes this and sees this and how close Penny is and how friendly Penny's willing to be and just how emotionally attached Penny is to the Winter Maiden dying, even though she doesn't even know her, even though she barely knows her at all. You know, she's still attached to her. She still grows attached to her that quickly, and that's when the Winter Maiden says, okay, I think you're the person I need to pass the powers on to. I think, you know, and so she dies with Penny in her thoughts, and that's how the powers get passed on. Essentially, that's how it works. That's the pow- That's the rules they've established so far, is that you need to have that person on your mind when you die. That's it. That's how the powers are passed on. Essentially. Okay. Phil, I guess. Still, Penny taking over this feels a bit out of left. I do agree. It's definitely, you know, it's definitely a twist. I, you know, especially when they set up Winter. I think, you know, when they set up Winter's going to take over the Winter Maiden role, I think everyone kind of thought, okay, she's probably not going to get it, right? I think they've been too, way too obvious about, hey, Winter's going to get these Winter Maiden powers. More than likely not, though, unless they do something with volume eight and Penny dies again, and then the powers are passed on to someone else, potentially. Who knows? Maybe they'll do that. (laughs) Poor Penny. She can never catch a break. But I I do think it works with, again, like I talked talked about before earlier, I do think Penny getting the Winter Maiden powers does work with you know, the entire idea of, you know, am I a real girl or am I not, you know, and the I- entire idea of, you know, is my soul my own or is it just given to me from someone else and I'm just 
a portion of their soul. I'm not my own person. I'm not human, quote unquote. You know, I think it does go along with that. And I think that's why they mostly did it of, you know, Penny is a real girl. She's not just a robot. She does have her own soul. She is her own person with her own thoughts, feelings, emotions, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's what they're going for and what they're trying to achieve with that. That's just my two cents, though. Again, you don't have to agree, and I do get where you're coming from when you say, you know, it, it does feel a bit like bad writing. It does feel a bit out of nowhere. I do get that. I don't necessarily agree, but I get it. But I guess, finally, you know, we have everyone coming together. Neo escapes with the lamp, and she takes that to Cinder, and then we come, everyone together, with them running away at the end, and at the very end we see Salem with her big, fuck-off, giant jelly whale grim arrive, and she's yeah, now an Atlas. this was something. This was something. <laughs> what did you think about the big, giant, fuck-off, jelly whale grim? Um... It's something. <laughs> it's something? I didn't like... I, I, I talked before about how a bit of background noise coming in on your mic a little bit. From, I think you're catching a bit of my yeah, audio. I, ca- I kind of caught it, yeah. Um, I didn't like Salem appearing when she hit when she appeared here. I think again, this comes back to that Ruby being too fast for its own good, and I think they wanted Salem to get here quick so they could, you know, do that part of the story because I think that's what they're more interested in going into is that kind of story. So I think they had Salem get here at the end of this volume. But I don't think that's the best idea, if I'm honest. I think Salem should have got here next volume. I think we should still be dealing with the conflict between, you know, Ruby and Co. and Ironwood and Co. before we move on to the conflict between Ruby and Co., Ironwood and Co., and Salem and Co., right? I just, I don't feel Salem showing up when she does is good, personally. But what do you think? I don't have much to say because, you know, it just felt like <laughs> we need a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. That's fair. But, uh, you know, it, it is, as, but as much as I'm like, uh, on, like, eh, cliffhanger, cliffhanger and stuff, it, it does make me interested in seeing where everything goes, mm-hmm. in, you know, next season. Oh, yeah, definitely. Agreed. It'll be interesting because, I mean, I guess, you know, Volume 8 will definitely be, the front half of Volume 8 will definitely be more action-heavy, I think, safe to say. If it's not, that would probably be a little bit weird. Unless we're doing yeah. the whole, you know, Naruto talk no jutsu deal. And everyone just decides, we're just going to talk at Salu and talk her down, maybe. If this is the ending, I'll point. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess... Oscar did try that with Ironwood in episode 13. He tried to talk no jutsu Ironwood, and Ironwood was like, fuck no, bitch. Blam. And shoots Oscar. <laughs> what did you think about that, that scene, by the way? Ironwood shooting Oscar as a final that was like That was like, okay, sure. <laughs> you shoot, shoot a person <laughs> down. Why not? Everyone got... You know, the big thing is Ironwood shot a kid. Oh my God, Ironwood shot a kid. That's you know a very big thing within the fandom. Well, right now. honestly, he honestly, it's a it's a fantasy show. Kids get shot all the time. It's not. But that's still a big thing for the fandom right now, which was interesting to see. Where you know, everything that's the thing that makes them hate Ironwood the most is that he shot a kid. That's the that's the final straw for them. <laughs> It was interesting, though some people had their straws much sooner than that break, but it was interesting to see that that was the final straw where everyone's like, Ironwood deserves to die now. No redemption for Ironwood. He can do nothing oh, good. This was, this was the key, that was the, key, the straw that brought the, the camels back. Yeah. For some people, at least, anyway. It was interesting to see. <laughs> you know? But, um, yeah. As much as I might say the finale wasn't my favorite for Volume 7, I do think there's some good moments here, right? And I, I did enjoy a lot of the stuff that's going through this. And I think, oh shit, we we kind of skipped over something you brought up a little bit earlier. Tyrion, Crow, and Clover's fight, where Clover dies. Yeah. I guess that's our big fi- fi- final point to go over. Clover's dead. What do you think? 
I'm guessing that's a big oh, old... Oh, no. <laughs> like, a big old... Meh. Yeah. I do get that. I think, right. you know, kudos to Jason Lebrecht, Crow's new voice actor. That scream from him at the end was really well done. Extremely well done. Like, he played that off very well as a VA, so great, you know, great work from him. I think he cemented, for me, I think that was the moment for me when he absolutely cemented that he's going to be a great, you know, VA for Crow moving forward. I think, you know, he's going to do great, simply put. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I hope he will also get woke other than this. If he, I think he uh, does have work know? elsewhere, but not a ton of work. But yeah, absolutely, I do agree. He deserves way more work because he's definitely very good. He's definitely been so, in other um, stuff, but it doesn't. Since we've basically been done, <laughs> I really need to get some to get something um, going over the hill. That's fair. Um, I'm sorry. Ending yeah. off. No, that's fair. Again, we can end off. Uh, yeah. Overall, great, great volume. Not you know perfect. Has its faults, but overall pretty good and enjoyable for the most part. But that's yep. been all for us here at the Outcast. We hope, we hope you've enjoyed. You enjoyed. If you want and, to do the outro, uh, go for us, it. The... Okay, that's all for this episode of The Outcast. You hope you enjoyed. What did you think about Volume 7? You see how natural this is coming, this is coming to me? Boom. You can tell us all about that in the comments below on our Tumblr, which is Belcast Team, and on our Twitter, which is Belcast with a capital B, capital C. So, with that being said, I was HC. And I was Wolf. And we'll talk to you all next time. Take care. Bye-bye.